Catherine is a certified genetic counselor and specialty genomic science liaison at Ambry Genetics. She completed her Bachelor of Science in Biology at the College of Charleston and received her Master's in Genetic Counseling from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. After graduate school, Catherine worked for several years in a multidisciplinary genetic or as a multidisciplinary genetic counselor at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. In 2016, she moved to Oklahoma City and transitioned to her current role at Ambry Genetics. As a genomic science liaison for the South Central United States, she serves as a clinical liaison for the field team to educate healthcare providers and other key opinion leaders on genetic testing and genomic medicine. So Catherine, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Megan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. As Megan mentioned, I'm going to be presenting some information and data from a recent research project regarding genetic testing in adult patients with neuro neurology disorders. There we go. Um, the only conflicts of interest and disclosures that I have is that I'm a full-time salaried employee at Ambry Genetics, and this presentation is going to be primarily focused on data that is pending publication from an internal research pro program. Our learning objectives for today largely center around the objectives of this study. The first thing that we wanted to do was examine the characteristics, ordering trends, and detection rates of genetic testing in patient, adult patients with neurologic phenotypes. This has been an area that has been really well described and published on in the pediatric patient population, and we really wanted to find out if there were differences in adults and further clarify kind of how genetic testing is being used for our adult patients with neurologic disorders. Secondly, we wanted to compare the use of multi-gene panel testing with diagnostic exome sequencing and how that was being used by clinicians in this patient population. Going forward, I'm gonna to refer to multi-gene panel testing as simply panels and diagnostic exome sequencing as simply exome, just to keep things kind of simple and straightforward. Finally, we really wanted to focus in and describe the clinical utility and possible impact of medical management that genetic testing can have in this patient population as we wanted to be sure that genetic testing had some type of implication for the care of the patients that were being seen and evaluated. For this study, we did a retrospective analysis of all patients undergoing either panel testing or exome sequencing between January of 2012 and August of 2019. Patients had to be over the age of 18 at the time of the referral for testing and had to have some type of neurologic indication for the test being ordered. We grouped the neurological phenotypes as reported um, by clinicians into phenotypic categories that you can see in the table on your screen. Um, I'm going to be utilizing a couple of different abbreviations that I just wanted to familiarize everyone with before we dive in deeper. I'm going to be referring to autism spectrum disorder as ASD and intellectual disability as ID on slides. I'll also use DD to describe developmental delay. We had a couple of categories where we combined patients that had multiple different neurologic phenotypes or had other phenotypes that weren't completely described by an isolated finding. The first part of this category were neurodevelopmental disorders, and for the terms of this study, we define that as a patient that had seizures and autism spectrum disorder with or without intellectual disability or developmental delay, and that'll be referred to as NDD on slides. We also had two categories of complex phenotypes that involved either other organ systems like cardiac features or neuromuscular disorders, um, as for example, in our multi-organ mix phenotype group. And then we had a group of patients that had a mixed neurologic phenotype. So they had epilepsy and potentially a movement disorder. So there were two different types of neurologic features that were being described. We refer to these as our more complex phenotypes as they evolve, involve either different organ systems or seemingly unrelated neurologic features. In terms of demo demographics, 1,356 patients met inclusion criteria for the study. 900 patients underwent exome sequencing and 456 individuals underwent panel testing. 10 patients had more than one panel that was ordered for them, so we ended up with a total of 466 multi-gene panels. 34 patients had both a panel and exome sequencing ordered either reflexively or concurrently. 
The graph on your slide shows the distribution of patients across phenotypic categories for both panel and exome. Overall, we saw that the primary clinical indication for testing was multi-organ mixed phenotypes. In the panels, we saw that the most common indication for testing was neurodevelopmental, and likewise for exome, we saw that multi-organ mixed phenotype was the most common reason patients were undergoing testing. Diving in a little bit deeper to the, di the diagnostic yields of genetic testing, we saw that about 11% of patients undergoing panels had a positive or likely positive result reported, and 20% of patients undergoing exome sequencing had some type of positive result. The diagnostic yield for panels was greatest among the panel subtype for neurodevelopmental disorders at about 13%, and patients panels specifically designed for patients with epilepsy or intellectual disability and autism had about 11% diagnostic yield. We saw a lower number of BUS results or uncertain results for exome sequencing when compared to panels. We had about 64% of our patients undergo TRIO analysis on exome sequencing. And in addition, clinical overlap was considered as part of a reason for reporting on exome sequencing. Both of these may contribute to a more clear um, clarification of the US results and leading to a smaller number of uncertain results overall in the reports that were generated. Previous molecular testing was reported for 30% of patients undergoing panels and roughly 78% of patients undergoing exome sequencing. The diagnostic yield was higher for patients undergoing panels that hadn't had any previous genetic testing. However, the opposite was true for patients with exome sequencing. Those that had had some type of previous molecular test were more likely to have a positive result. The types of previous molecular tests that were ordered largely centered around a microarray, fragile X, or other neurology multi-gene panels. Looking at the diagnostic yield, you can see in the graph on the slide the diagnostic yield by clinical category. We saw that among panels, the highest diagnostic yield was reported in patients with a more complex phenotype of the mixed neurologic or multi-organ phenotype as well as neurodevelopmental disorders. However, there was no statistical difference among diagnostic yield across the clinical categories for panels. Looking more specifically at exome sequencing, we saw the highest diagnostic rates across clinical categories, including neurodevelopmental disorders, developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, as well as the complex phenotypes. With exome sequencing, we did see statistically significant differences in detection rate by clinical indication. Patients that had a neurodevelopmental phenotype were more likely to have a positive result, whereas patients with a movement disorder or neuromuscular disorder were less likely to have a positive result. This is likely representative of the type of mutations and type of genetic diagnoses we see in the former group of patients, um, whereas exome sequencing has a, more of a technical limitation in detecting repeat expansion disorders, for example, so this is somewhat of an expected result. We had 34 patients that underwent both panel testing and exome sequencing, either concurrently or reflexively. Following panel testing, 16 of those patients, roughly 47%, had an uncertain finding. After undergoing exome sequencing, only two remained in that uncertain category. The report classification was upgraded for four patients with an uncertain result, as well as one patient with a negative panel result, bringing our overall positive rate from about 6% to roughly 20% for this patient category. The upgrades in this group were largely due to new gene findings that weren't previously reported on the panel. Of all of the panel reports um, and genes that were included, only two, both of which were resulted out as positive, contained these same gene findings on exome as they did on panel. Additionally, we had 10 uncertain panel results that were resolved to negative exome, following exome sequencing. The overall reason um, for reclassification of these results differed um, depending on the case. And we saw that roughly 50% of individuals in this patient population had received a different re overall result classification when going from their panel test to exome sequencing. 
Almost 15% of these patients had some type of change that impacted their diagnosis, such as going from a negative panel report to a positive exome report, or having their inconclusive panel result change to that of a positive, like we just mentioned. There were no patients that received a positive panel report that had a downgraded exome report. Overall, the reason for the um, change in this overall classification largely centered around the availability of familial samples for co-segregation analysis. Having these available at the time of exome sequencing allowed, it, allowed us to exclude variants based on lack of segregation with disease. And testing of these family members played a real pivotal role in being able to clarify the overall result for our uninformative panel patients. We also saw that a poor clinical overlap between the gene disease association and the clinical phenotype of the patient played a role in the differing results between panel and exome as well. Oops, there we go. Um, so in summary of our diagnostic results, we saw that um, patients undergoing panels were more likely to have a higher diagnostic yield if they had a more complex phenotype such as mixed neurologic phenotype or neurodevelopmental disorders. We saw that this was especially true in the context of exome sequencing for patients with the similar phenotypes as well as intellectual disability and autism, but patients with neurodevelopmental disorders were most likely to have a positive exome report. This isn't entirely surprising as the largest number and the largest growth in gene classification in most recent years has been in the neurodevelopmental patient population. And exome sequencing allows us the opportunity to report on novel gene findings and incorporate these um, new characterizations and new information on these gene disease relationships in real time. Whereas with panel testing, you have to update those and that lags a little bit behind the current knowledge and information. And we'd expect that as panels become larger, new panels are pushed out to market, that there may be more of a difference between those detection rates, especially if you're able to incorporate that information in more real time. In our patients that had both exome sequencing and panels, we saw that the addition of exome sequencing added to the overall diagnostic yield, particularly in clarifying uncertain panel results. The addition of patients having family members to be able to be sequenced alongside their exome in a trio type setting for exome allowed us to be able to incorporate that co-segregation information into variant interpretation, as well as the overall interpretation of the results. It is quite possible that incorporating parental studies or parental samples into panel testing could also help further classify and clarify these uncertain results on the front end with panels as well. So looking a little bit more into provider trends, we wanted to understand, are there any differences in what types of providers are ordering genetic testing for these patients? Yeah, so we um, looked at these and saw that roughly 97% of the orders involved a physician as the primary ordering provider, and about 50% included a genetic counselor. These represented about 446 unique ordering physicians and 200 49 unique genetic counselors. We did have genetic counselors and physicians that ordered multiple tests, um, but they were counted once in our overall classification. For the physicians, we wanted to better understand what provider specialties or specialty medical providers were ordering testing for these patients. And when we looked, we saw that the majority had some type of additional or specialized training in neurology or genetics which we'll refer to as neurologist and geneticist, as this is likely their primary specialty. Very few of our ordering providers had both a specialized training in neurology or genetics, but we did see a handful of other specialties that were ordering tests for this patient population. 50% of our tests were ordered by a physician alone, meaning that no genetic counselor was associated with the order. And we saw some differences between the types of patients that were being referred by these providers, as well as their ordering trends. We noticed that neurologists were more likely to be associated with the more isolated phenotypes and order testing for those patients. These include um, the phenotypic indications of epilepsy, as well as neurodevelopmental disorders and mixed neurologic. Um, phenotypes, whereas geneticists were equally 
a little more evenly distributed across the clinical phenotypes, but they tended to have slightly higher frequencies in the more complex phenotypes, like your mixed organ and your multi-system um, neurology disorders. We saw significant differences in ordering by test type, where neurologists were more likely to order a panel for their patients, and geneticists were more likely to order exome sequencing. 59% of the orders included a genetic counselor, um, and we saw that genetic counselors were more likely to be involved in exome orders, as you can see on um, the graph. Genetic counselors also tended to be involved in patient phenotypes that tended to be a little more complex and um, not as involved in patients that had a more simplistic or straightforward clinical presentation. When looking across all clinical indications, we saw no difference in diagnostic yields comparing orders with a genetic counselor versus those without a genetic counselor. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> There's a delay and I overclicked. Um, so looking at just to summarize the provider ordering trends, we saw that the ordering physician type impacted the test that was ordered for the patient as well as the diagnostic yield. We saw that neurologists and geneticists were the most likely ordering um, providers and specialty type to be ordering testing for these patients. That's not entirely surprising, particularly when you think about the patient population and the types of providers that they're most likely to be involved with in terms of who's most likely to order genetic testing, as well as who's seeing them for treatment, management, and diagnosis, and those tend to be a neurologist or a geneticist. We saw that neurologists tended to order panels while geneticists preferred exome sequencing. And while we didn't look into this in this study, it may be because they're looking, these two provider types are looking for different types of information or approaching genetic testing from a different standpoint. A neurologist being a primary person who's treating and managing patients with neurologic disease may have a stronger focus on that and tend to want to order panels that have genes that have been more longly described and associated with disorders, and they have the ability to be able to be tested and put through trials to have treatment recommendations or management recommendations. Whereas the geneticist may be seeing these more complex patients with a broader phenotype and larger differential diagnosis and want to utilize exome sequencing as a way to evaluate patients for an atypical presentation or variable presentation of a genetic syndrome or disease. We saw that the inclusion of a genetic counselor on the order did not impact the overall diagnostic yield. However, we didn't assess for other aspects of patient care and genetic testing that genetic counselors may be involved in. It's entirely possible that a genetic counselor's primary impact in this patient population with genetic testing may be associated with something like patient understanding or appropriateness of an order that just wasn't assessed as part of this study. Getting into our final piece that we wanted to look at was the clinical utility of testing and how ordering genetic testing may impact the medical management of the patient being tested. Overall, we saw that the results had medical management implications for over half of the patients in our study, and they were equally likely to have some type of impact between uh, in medical management involving syndromic clinical monitoring, meaning that they had an identif identified pathogenic or likely pathogenic change in a gene that was associated with some type of syndrome, and they needed to have another organ system evaluated, like cardiac features or something like that, in addition to neurologic findings. And we also saw that patients had some precision medicine implications, so that there was some type of implication after finding a pathogenic or likely pathogenic in a variant that calls patients to consider another type of therapeutic intervention, such as enzyme replacement therapy or a particular type of medication that they should use or one that would be counterindicated based on the results of genetic testing. Looking further into this precision medicine group, um, we saw that almost 43% of patients had an identifiable and reportable finding on testing that fell into one of these three categories. Roughly 17, 18% of these patients had some type of um, implication for biomedical in intervention, which included largely enzyme replacement therapy, but also metabolic diet restrictions or diet changes, such as a ketogenic diet for several, for three of the patients in this category. 
In terms of pharmaceutical interventions, patients were equally likely between these two to have either a contraindication to a particular medicine or type of medicine, as well as an indication for, testing, for therapeutic intervention. These largely centered around anti-epileptic drugs and recommendations for drug trials or avoidance of certain drugs based on the gene pathway and overall mechanism of the disease. The clinical utility of genetic tests, the, the testing differed between an exome and a panel. Patients undergoing exome sequencing were more likely to have implications for syndromic clinical management versus patients undergoing panel testing, where they were more likely to have a precision medicine implication. This is likely due to the difference in the types of genes um, that are being included and considered for reporting on these. Um, different tests where panels have a larger focus on the medical management implications and established gene disease associations, whereas like we talked about earlier, exome sequencing is likely um, identifying more variable expression and atypical presentations of syndromic disorders that had additional medical management recommendations for non-neurologic findings. Doing that. I'm sorry. Um, so to summarize the clinical utility, the genetic, te genetic testing revealed medical management implications in half of the adults undergoing testing in our study. These um, patients had medically actionable genes that were reported that directly impacted their patient care, and the particular type of test that they had impacted the type of medical management implication um, that was associated with those results. Patients who are undergoing panels were more likely to have a directed precision medicine implication that involved a particular um, medical intervention or treatment based on that particular gene disease association, whereas exome sequencing identified more syndromic causes. We think this is likely due to just the differences in the way that a panel, the genes on a panel are curated and pulled together, where they tend to have more established gene disease associations. They've had time to go through these clinical trials and are generally ones that have very well associated and followed patient um, populations. So you have more availability to be able to recognize how different medical interventions may impact those patients. Whereas most of our syndromic causes found on exome were kind of atypical presentations or different presentations of diseases that may not have necessarily been considered or thought of to be included on a panel um, because of the vast overlap um, in clinical phenotypic presentations. So in conclusion, um, we set out at the beginning of the study to kind of point at three main um, three main objectives. First, we saw that genetic testing is ordered by a wide array of um, providers for neurologic indications on patients, and the diagnostic yield was higher for the more complex phenotypes in both panels and exome, but would be specifically higher for patients that had a neurodevelopmental clinical phenotype. Exome had the highest diagnostic yield for this particular type of patient indication, and including exome sequencing after a panel offered an increase in diagnostic yield and could be beneficial to this particular patient population. Second, we saw that the majority of ordering providers had a specialized training in either neurology or genetics and tended to order tests a little bit differently depending on the provider type. Neurologists preferred to order panel testing for patients where geneticists tended to cast a wider net and opt for exome sequencing. Genetic counselors were included on roughly half of the orders, but their inclusion on the test did not impact the overall diagnostic yield. And then finally, we saw that the results of genetic testing identified medical management changes in over half of the patients included in our study. Patients were equally likely to have an implication for precision medicine or therapeutic intervention versus additional screening and surveillance of syndromic features that may be associated with the identified and diagnosed disease.
at the end of the day, um, this study really just proved that genetic testing is beneficial for adults with neurologic disorders. Exome sequencing can provide the high highest diagnostic rates as we're able to incorporate in real time updates and expansions in our knowledge and understanding of gene disease associations with neurologic disease. And this is particularly true for patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, as this has been one of the areas with the largest growth in gene disease discovery. Genet exome sequencing can also be highly beneficial for patients because it allows us the ability to do familial co-segregations of co-segregation studies to clarify those variants of uncertain significance, allowing more patients to receive a firm positive or negative result in comparison to panels where there's a larger portion of patients that receive an uncertain result. It's likely that with the expansion of our knowledge and the ability um, to offer larger, more easy to update panels that we'll see a better diagnostic rate for these patients on panel testing and the inclusion of familial testing or parental testing as part of that will help clarify those VUS rates and we'll see a smaller difference between exome sequencing and panel testing in this patient population. Most importantly, the results of genetic testing can impact medical management as well as refine the recurrence risk for future generations and identify other family members that are at risk. Therefore, genetic testing should be something that is considered and included in the workup and, and diagnosis and treatment for patients with neurologic disorders. So with that, um, I would like to thank you guys for listening in and particularly thank um, Kirsten Blanco that worked on this project with me. She put in a lot of work and effort um, into this and we're really happy that we were able to share it with y'all. Um, I'll pause here and allow you guys to submit any questions that you may have. Um, and I'll turn it over to Megan to kind of start going through those. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, and as a reminder, there over in your um, pop-up navigation window, there is a place to submit questions. So please feel free to go ahead and send any that you have in um, and I will start reading those. Um, so the first question is, what clinical indications in adults would you recommend panel testing over exome testing? So I, to answer that question, I think it's most beneficial to order panels, particularly for adult patients with movement disorders or neuromuscular disorders. Those tended to be, as we saw in this study, um, the patient indications that had the lowest detection rate on exome sequencing. And with movement disorders specifically, we know that most of the types of mutations are repeat expansions, and that's a technical limitation of exome. Um, so those are going to be the types of patients that you're going to want to probably consider a panel first. Um, and then depending on what's going on with the patient, maybe exome sequencing would be a valuable add. Great. Um, next question. Can you comment on how this adult population and the reporting trends differ from what might be seen in a pediatric population? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things I saw, and let me see if I can figure out how to get back there, um, is if we look at the clinical categories and the distribution of those, I think this kind of speaks to where we may see differences in the pediatric population. Um, on the far left-hand side, where we see the patients with autism spectrum disorders and intellectual disability, these tended to be a lot lower than I was initially expecting, and I think that's because most of most patients undergo genetic testing in the pediatric population and the pedi through that um, side. So I would expect those to be a little bit higher and to see kind of a shift in the overall diagnostic yield towards that patient group um, when compared to your adult. Great. Um, okay, next question was, with a lack of published guidelines for genetic testing in the adult neurology population, what are some of the hurdles for reimbursement for panels and for exomes in this group? So that's a great question. And we didn't look into that um, for this particular study, but I'd imagine the lack of guidelines kind of play a role in that. Um, the other thing that I think kind of plays into reimbursement for genetic testing is the impact on clinical utility and medical management. Insurance companies tend to want to know that the test you're ordering is going to change something about what you're doing with that patient and add value. So the more studies we have that demonstrate that you do this test, you get this result, it changes what we have for medical management, can help drive some of those changes in medical policy 
and increase our ability to be able to offer it to patients and patients have insurance coverage to benefit them, but also kind of on the flip side allows labs to be able to be reimbursed for the testing that they're offering. Great, so basically getting this data out there in the literature can hopefully push that needle forward. Exactly. Okay, and then for the, the variants that were identified on panels that were later downgraded on exome based on family studies, were family samples not available for those panels um, or were they just not run? So it wasn't clear from the way that we were um, looking at the data, whether they were included on part of the panel or not. It certainly was an option, um, and it may have just been that they, the clinicians opted to send it for the exome sequencing, or they were ordered at several, separate parts in time. Um, but it wasn't clear from the data we were looking at if that was kind of a particular point, but it would be something that'd be really interesting to look at. And I think if, um, if that, Samples were available at the time of panels. Um, I think they would have been run, correct? The parent samples? Yes, they should have been if they were indicated for testing. Yeah. Um, and then someone just asked if this is from a publication and to share the citation. So this is a pending publication that this data is for. So hopefully we'll have a, um, a citation that we can send around in the upcoming months with hopefully a, a positive review um, from a journal. Um, and the next question, were there any reinterpretations in this cohort, either a patient who had initially negative exome and had a finding in a novel gene at a later date, or a reinterpretation of a previously identified variant that was reclassified based on new data other than COSAG? Yeah, so there was a handful of patients um, where that was the case. There was at least two that went from a panel to exome where the information available for the variant was updated, so we were able to reclassify it. Um, it just wasn't a chart that we included in this presentation, but that was certainly something that had an impact. Um, and I think if I go back to the slide here, um, that's where kind of this new variant data came into play. This happened for one patient um, in this group, and then we also saw some differences in clinical overlap that played a role in that clarification as well. Megan, are you aware of any other ones, um, since she worked on this with me too, um, where that may have been the case? Yeah, there were a few exome cases where we initially reported an alteration as an um, uncharacterized gene. And then later on, uh, through additional publications in the literature, we're able to characterize that gene and issue a new report back to that um, provider with the new um, classification. So that was, I, it was a small percentage of the population. I think it was about 1%, um, but that did happen in a handful of cases. Okay, so if anyone else has questions, please feel free to send those in. Um, we'll pause just for another minute. Um, see if any other questions come in, and if not, we can wrap up a little early. Okay, so no other questions are coming in. So we'll go ahead and um, talk a little bit about our next upcoming um, Educate Next, which will be on August 26th. And it's on homologous recombination, deficit diagnosis, and PARP inhibitor therapy. And that's gonna be presented by Brady Culver. So hopefully you can all um, join us again for that. And thank you so much for your time today. Have a great rest of your week.